I'm prepared then. All right. Oh my God, this is the first ever video episode of At the Elephants ever. I'm truly honored. You should be. It's an absolute coincidence uh, <laughs> that it's you, but also a blessing. You're very lovely. This <laughs> is going to be a very lovely chat. I, I wore my velvet blazer for the occasion. Amazing. Thanks. I often wear a blazer when I perform, and I'm not in one at all. I'm very cash. So I. Are you performing? Not right now. Right. So. Not at all. Not even kind of. Me neither. That is one of my favorite things about podcasts in general is because I don't feel at all like I'm performing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I just feel like I'm talking to you and I'm letting people watch us. And we haven't talked in so long. Right. So it's kind of like, you know, a reunion of sorts, which is usually a friendly, casual, fun thing. I'm trying really hard to remember. I don't know when the first time that I, I don't know when we met. Well, Do we meet doing Beach Week? The thing about NCSA or UNCSA, as it's currently called. Sure. The thing about the culture of people, alums and students, you know, which we used to be. Right. Is you kind of like people, you hear about people before you meet them. Yeah. So I, yeah, because it's such a small school. Right. So I think I knew who you were long before we ever talked. What? Don't you think? Maybe, but I feel like, I feel like. Maybe I heard about you right before I met you. Maybe, Maybe. someone talked about you uh, on like the way to doing Beach Week, but I don't remember. Right. I feel like I knew you were before we like officially talked because I feel well, my like vanity that's... absolutely wants to know what you remember knowing <laughs> about me before you met me. I don't really remember, but at the I re- I I don't remember anymore. But I I just I have like this. Uh, memory of culture at NCSA of mm-hmm. like just knowing who people were without really having close relationships with them and then I would develop friendships with people after already having known who they were. I feel like one of the things that happened all the time was and this is this is maybe a particular thing because it did happen with you uh, is because so many people at school were so pretty (laughs) it was such a thing. Like, people would talk about it all the time, just in general. They'd be like, I mean, everyone yeah. is so hot. Because, like, half of the arts are about being beautiful. Exactly. <laughs> and they're drafting mine, the most talented people. But, yeah. And so, what do you mean by not yours? Like, music, you don't have to be beautiful. It's but not like, an element. But, like, some of the... This is going to sound really bad. I'm not going to say it. I, I was going somewhere with, like, the drama girls are usually really pretty. But that's not why they're chosen. It just happens that a lot of them are really pretty. And same with the ballerinas. That is so not true. What? I I don't know. I I can't get into why they're chosen or not chosen because I don't choose them. Amazing actors. Yeah, they're amazing actors, but I they're hot, and that's part of it. Not like they have some bar where you have to be. There's just no way. Like, there's so many talented actors who are not beautiful, and just so happens all the beautiful ones end up at this one place. Interesting thought. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't think that's what it is. I think they're intentionally like, we're trying to so? prepare people for the business. Gotcha. And there's only so many character actors. Right. But I think that the I think that the attitude on it has shifted quite a bit. And again, I, I'm not in charge of picking people to drama school. I worked as a teacher for one summer, so I'm not qualified like to discuss see, this. You know, we see the but waves if you just people. look yeah. at who is in the classes... First of all, they have shifted to 50-50, and for the uh, gender-wise. I figured that was what you meant. Yeah, and for a really long time, it was like two to one. More girls. No, more More men. More boys. So, and and the argument was there are more parts. Right. So it's like we're drafting an ensemble that we can work with as far as what most pieces we're working with have to offer, Mm -hmm. I think was the attitude. Um and they're, they've gotten far more ethnically diverse and totally. uh, far more diverse in the world of uh, gender. Um, but I think it, back to my point, was they still, and I you know I don't keep cl- super close tabs on who's there now, Same. but every now and then I see pictures, mm-hmm. they all still look hot. Yeah. So it's like, that's not changing, you know? They're changing up a lot of things, but they're not like, you know what, let's go a little less hot. Right. Let's get more diverse no, hot in that is, category. Yep, hot's always popular. So... When you are on a campus when people are very pretty, a lot of times you'll hear about people who are exceptionally pretty. (laughs) And I feel like that's what I heard about you before I met you. For real. That's both embarrassing and very kind. 
it's yeah well it's also like the reality i think of what happened i remember it happened too with it's funny enough someone else who was on uh beach week uh mckenzie Oh my God! When I she's so beautiful. That is exactly what she's the fuck like. I'm talking one of about the top though. beauties of NCSA in my mind of like all time. She is very very pretty and Mackenzie, we uh, think you're beautiful. She's we both at, have crushes on. She's you. not listening to this. It's okay. Um, I'm sure someone maybe someone who <laughs> maybe gives a shit will, will listen and then tell her is the best we're gonna do with Mackenzie. I think. Um, but yeah, no, she's absolutely gorgeous. Mm-hmm. But before I met her countless people and I was it was because I was going to live with her gotcha. um, I was moving to town and we were both subletting the same place for the summer and so they we were both getting told by people like this is your roommate right like it's going to be this person and people were just like oh my god you're living with Mackenzie oh man she's so hot she's so pretty girls boys teachers yeah. Yeah. janitors everybody's like obje- what Mackenzie oh my god yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't know, you could feel however you want about it, but that's kind of how they were talking about you when we were that's like, amazing. we're going to go do this like beach week thing. They were like, because uh, we, we had Rebecca Wolf maybe Rebecca first. Wolf. Yep. And yeah, that maybe was right. she the very first one? Maybe. I honestly do not remember the progression, but I just like, because I was dating Dylan, I was like thrown in as the token woman for many things. So mm. it was like, if somebody would drop out of like a shoot, you know, right for one of their projects. It was like, well, Lee's free. Yeah, <laughs> she's a musician. They have lots of time to practice. So, so your, I was your practice f- time became acting time. I was the fill in on a lot of stuff, and also one of my best friends, um, Nick Leopold. Sure. Also was in the film school, and so I was like filling in for things for Nick and filling in for things for Dylan, and so I was just like a convenient fill in. It was also a time when, and it, I think it fluctuated probably a lot over the years. It was a time when the film school and the drama school were really closely connected. Totally, yes. Like a lot, and, and it happens when people are sleeping with each other. If you can get enough people across schools yep. sleeping with each other, it There's bonds collabor- the whole, it's collaborative. yeah, it's huge. Totally. Like, and I remember specifically for a while being like, oh man, it's so weird that, there's no crossover anymore. And then I thought about it and I was like, oh, all they the drama stopped. students are sleeping with each other this year. Gotcha. So like that's why it's not happening because yep. there's not enough there's not enough um, collaboration in the Collab- bedroom leads to collaboration in the studio. You, you know, know, I dated a, a drama kid as they're called. I dated a drama kid too for a while. And uh, I showed up in a bunch of their student projects as well. That's how that goes. That's how it goes. You get signed up for it. <laughs> yep. Um, no, that's actually how I made it into the drama school because I was in design and production. Yeah, I kind I, of remember your yeah. time, your history. Did you sure. do directing stuff too? That's what I graduated in. Okay, directing, so you went from uh, drama DNP to drama to directing, or DNP I mean, to yeah, directing? but drama directing is within the drama school. So you were so never acting in the drama school. I was because uh, the way that it works is kind of like film where for the first two years okay. you don't you can't be a director mm-hmm. and the directing program is really a third and fourth year thing. Got it. So I transferred at the end of my first year from lighting to drama, which meant I was an actor. Right. But he Gerald kind of made some exceptions for me and he he created a kind of hybrid program where I was still assistant directing mm-hmm. um, and some of my focuses in little areas, you know, all the teachers knew I was going to be a director. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times in class, that would mm-hmm. change the dynamic of yeah. how I interacted with stuff. Yeah, I vaguely remember that about your journey, that it was a little bit different, which is super cool. I am su- I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm very surprised to hear you know anything about my journey. No, I remember that. Only be- I don't know how I remember that. It's no, it's very interesting. I think because it was unique, so I was yeah, like, maybe. "Oh wow, why does Rob get this?" It's it's definitely a, yeah. It's a, it's not a thing that happened a bunch of times, and uh, I don't recommend it uh, for anyone. I said that at the time. I was yeah. like, "This is." I'm glad they made an exception for me, but I don't think anyone should do this. Right. Like transferring within a conservatory right. is weird. And, yeah, uh, I'm sure. But that's. I mean, you know, despite. I don't even know what despite, but like definitely, I, I almost said like despite my efforts, but I don't think I really tried not to. That kind of shit always happens to me. I'm not really sure what it's about. I mean, it's kind of fun. I don't though. just mean exceptions being made necessarily. Sometimes I mean that, mm-hmm. but I mean like I enter into a system not really knowing what's going on, and then later as I look back and I'm like everybody was kind of doing A B C D, and I was doing like A X two yeah. or red, and people were like, "What? That's not how we do this here." But- 
I just ended up doing it. And I don't know if it's a combination of like entitlement of like, oh, I'll just bend this new system to be how I want. You don't seem entitled. I appreciate that. You don't. I, I never thought you I question that were. about myself a lot. No, I never was under that impression. I feel that I think there the were a time. lot of entitled kids at NCSA. Yeah, right. If you know, know, I never know thought it would that be in that pool. you were one of them. I Did you live that. at 1910? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's probably- For a year. That's one thing I remember most about you because other than your journey- that was a little bit different right because I like discovered 1910 like I convinced the homeowner to let kids live there right he did not want to right and I like found I don't know if you even know that but like I found that house it was that house and the house next door were both for sale Mm -hmm. and I do you mean the house next door like the little garage house behind it or do you mean the one immediately next door the one right next door because it was on the corner yeah 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 so the next one over I don't even remember the street address it was like a blue right and they owned that huge yard that was just like a field next to the house and the same guy owned both of these houses and then he had a really nice house like a country club or something but he was super nice guy. I called him up and I was like, hello, would you consider letting students rent the house from you? I know that you are trying to sell it, but like, what if we paid you this much and right. we're really clean and we're like, you know, really uh, responsible and mature. And mm-hmm. I don't know how I convinced him to let us do it, but um, I convinced him. And then it was me and like the original crew of people at 1910 and then it like segued into this really cool Bowers kind of really took it over once he uh, I don't even know that yeah John I don't even know that well and I don't know what happened after we left but um John moved in with Kyle Siegel and um Leo Martin the year before we were there yeah so Leo moved in around the time I moved out Mm -hmm. and then I never was there with those same guys like I remember Leo moving in but that's like the last I remember of are you 2011 uh, 2010. Wait, 2010. What year did you graduate, Lee? 2010. You think 2010? Well, because high school, 2006. I graduated from high school. Oh, there. word. Okay. And then college, 2010. So you're high school, 2006. Yeah. Oh shit, we're the same age. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Did crazy. you go there for high school? You didn't. No, I didn't. But I did graduate high school in 2006. Right. Yeah. We're in the same class. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Um. No, I was 2013. Okay. For my various hopping around gotcha. and getting of in-state tuition and shit. Right. Um. Where the fuck are you from? I've North never Carolina. known this about you. I'm from you. Winston-Salem. Oh, you're another I'm, townie. I'm born. Well, I wasn't raised there. I okay. was there for, I was there until I was six or so, five or six. All and right. then I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina. And I, and I, when I was a kid, I had this like narrative in my head that I was never going to attend in CSA. Why? I don't know. I think it was like, I always had dreams of of, um, travel and moving around and like being a free bird, you know? And so I think to have gone to college in the same place that I was born felt very- Oh, sure. There's a word. It felt very like provincial. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. So I think I always was kind of like anti. And that's classic. So what changed? Uh, Nothing changed. I mean, that's like story of my life. Story of my life is I'm not going to do that. And then I do it. Yeah. And I like live live my whole life thinking I'm not going to do it, and then I'm doing it. Do you think that there's any chance that your impulse reaction of I'm not going to do that does it? First of all, let me clarify before I move forward. Does it feel like an impulse thing? Like you encounter that, and it's an instant like aversion. Like I'm, that's not my choice. No, it's almost. Or are like these it... things coming from a really steady? Like I thought about it a lot. Yeah. I really made up my mind. <laughs> I'm not going to fucking do that. And then later you evolve into wanting to do exactly that right and it fulfills you i think it's neither going to ncsa was extremely fulfilling and i i would even say that it was life-changing and like very self-affirming um like it truly changed my life but what about it well let's let me finish sure the thought because it's neither of those things right, I right, think right, it's, right right i think my aversion to going to ncsa was like a like a constant like I didn't decide it one day it was just always how I felt about it which doesn't really answer your question no but that's super interesting I don't know I think that's I just always remember feeling that way just constantly and then because I would go there every Christmas to go to candle tea in old Salem okay that was like a family tradition and we would always go see the NCSA production of the Nutcracker every year at Christmas time so I was there experiencing like NCSA at Christmas Every year since I was a ba- like a little child. Right. And so every year I had that, oh, I'll never go there. <laughs> every year. I don't know. And then it made sense for me to go there in high school for various reasons. And then it made sense for me to stay there for college for various reasons. And so if you want to go back to the 
life affirming life-changing stuff I mean don't you feel like it was like that for a lot of people no I think it was definitely life-changing for a lot of people but I think it was so many it affects people in so many different ways yeah. I think there are a lot of shared experiences but I I'm very interested in what they are it's funny because this is interestingly enough not something we actually talk about on the show very much oh, really I feel like it has to be like the main theme you know what's interesting is that we don't talk about school all that fucking much I mean really? we do we do but it ends up being about other things you know yeah. it's evolved obviously so much since we started and I don't want to get too off track but originally this show was all recent graduates like okay. when I first started because that's who I knew yeah and it evolved into like talking to the faculty and then I started doing it again this last year and mm -hmm. really cranking out an episode every week mm -hmm. and talking to all sorts of different people. And it just goes all over the fucking place. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's focused in the original intent of of like, what did you do when you graduated? Gotcha. How is getting jobs going and shit yeah. like that? Which is because such an interesting conversation. And I feel like that's so important for the current students. A hundred percent. The problem with that is sometimes I feel like we're headed down a track that we've already talked about on the show. Yeah. And I don't want to take anybody's experience away from them and say it's not unique. I know right. that it is. But I get interested in other shit. Yeah. And a lot of times one of my number one things I'm interested in just as a person is your stories as a person. Right. Like what do you come from and, and what does your family do for a living? Like these kind of things that I remember and I've said this on the show before. Uh, Joe Mills who was on the show. Mm-hmm. Had me in a class once uh, that was about interviewing, and he wanted me to come in to talk to the class about doing the show. Mm -hmm. And he said, what do you start with? And I said, I always, my first and only premeditated question is, where are you from? I, it goes I just, from there. Yeah, and I'm, I never run out of shit to talk about yeah. after that. Usually, it's either like, well, I feel like we've gotten a good chunk, and it's been plenty of time. Or I'm like, we just got to fucking turn this off. Like we've been doing yeah. this too long. We like it's been three hours. So we stop. We we have to stop. Yeah. Um. It's always one of those two. It's never like twenty minutes, and I'm like, okay, Yay. well this has been good. I'll see you later. Like, and it just doesn't go like that. And it's because I'm genuinely interested in mm -hmm. this in the person and what I'm what I'm asking them. Mm -hmm. And the thing that is universally interesting to me is where people are from. Mm -hmm. You can tell me what you're doing now, mm -hmm. and you can tell me all the cool projects you've worked on and plug all the shit you got coming up. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. I think that's a six minute conversation. Right. Honestly. Yeah. And if someone and they have been on the show before and try to make it a longer conversation than that, mm -hmm. I get bored mm -hmm. because I'm like, I get it. You're hustling. You're trying to get yourself out there. All these yeah. like vague. We're all artists. Yeah. It's the same way, you know, and I always, you know, struggle to not bring this up, but that I feel about politics these days totally. where it's just like. We're going to reunite everybody and make it good and everything's going to be awesome and we need unity. And it's like you have not mentioned a policy proposal yet. Right. What are you doing? Yeah. Like I'm the details are super interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole reason that I started this. So mm -hmm. the only thing I go into is where you're from. And I was in Joe's class. I said, where are you from? And he goes, I love having you in here. And it's this is so NTSA, right? This guy invites me into the class. No conversation about what we're going to talk about. Yeah. He doesn't say, like, this is what it's going to be. Be prepared. And he asked me that question. I give the answer. And he goes, the first thing I say on the first day of this class is, like, don't ask people where they're from. <gasps> it's the most boring thing that you could ask. Interesting. And I thought, I, and again, I don't go over the same things because we have talked about this on the show before. But that's because, in my mind, what he means when he says that is, don't get a city. Right. Because who gives a shit what city you're from out mm -hmm. of context? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm from Detroit. Oh, I'm from St. Paul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. That is boring as fuck. Yeah. Where you're from is not about a fucking geographical location, really. Yeah. It starts with like two sentences on that. And maybe it's interesting. Mm -hmm. But usually it's like it immediately goes into their story of like, well, I've lived here and then mm -hmm. I moved to this place. Mm -hmm. And then that always gets me to the other thing that's very interesting to me that a lot of people think are boring, which is what do your parents do for a living? Hmm. So, Which I actually am fascinated by as well. And I always ask people. I think it's incredible to see, A, did you do what they did? Yeah. B, did you do something totally off the wall different? Yeah. Are those, they, how have they felt And about how it? do they feel about whether you did one of those other things? Yeah. And then, of course, there's a myriad of other options. But right. 
we as Americans define ourselves by our work. Totally. Oh, hi. Nice to meet you, Lee. What do you do? What do you do? Yeah. Right? I've had that conversation on so many gigs with people. And it drives you crazy a mm -hmm. little bit as an artist because, first of all, we don't want to be painted into a box, man. And so there's a little bit of that pretension where we're like, we're an artist. It means lots of stuff. Right. So that's involved. You know, and it would be unfair to say, like, you are a violinist, period. Right. That's just not fair. Mm -hmm. And so what I try really hard to do is break that open by exploring, okay, what what did your Where parents you do from? for a living? Yeah. Which I know for a fact they took too seriously. Why? Because they're <laughs> Americans. Yeah. And that's what we do. We yeah. take it way too seriously what we do. We define ourselves by it. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't meet a lot of people who are the exception to that. And and if they are, they'll come up in that conversation. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, so. What are your parents you Transition. Yeah, exactly. What do your parents do for a living, Lee? <laughs> um, Both violinists. Well, classical concert violinists, would right? Would you guess that they are or are not? Are not. Okay. Absolutely not. No way. <laughs> but what makes you think that? Most aren't. Okay. Um, a lot of times artists are produced by, in my experience doing the show, Artists are often produced by affluent people with boring jobs. Affluent people. I don't think their jobs are boring, but I'm sure some people do. And I don't mean for them. Yeah. I mean to you. Because a lot okay. of times, mm -hmm. and I, again, I'm not speaking about you necessarily because we have not yet heard your story, but a lot of times, oh my God, one of my favorite people in the world is Matt Cower, and he did like episode eight or nine of this show. And that dude, his dad runs a company that makes boat foam <laughs> that they put in boats to make them float. Right. And he likes his yeah, job. He must I'm not saying he must he's it. bored. Right. I'm saying that Matt Cower, who is a cartoon of a human being that I love very much, Just was never going to take over the yeah, boat foam his family company. family business. Yeah. Yeah. God. Like... I'm sure the thought of that to him is excruciating. Yeah. And that is what's super common. Yeah. Is you have someone who pursues, for many reasons, something that's a little bit mundane, but yeah. it's sturdy as fuck. And right. it creates an environment right. where you feel comfortable being like, I want to pursue art. Yeah. I want to play music. I want to yeah. act. I want to dance. And I feel comfortable to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not growing up in a house where I'm like, I better go be a lawyer. We're right. fucked. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a different dynamic. Yeah. Again, it's not everybody. Mm -hmm. But no, I would not assume so. Like, why? Billy Gorn, who you probably mm -hmm. know, yeah. also plays the fuck out of the violin. His parents are artists. Okay. He's the exception that proves the rule. And it does happen. I mean, it uh, happens. For sure. There were people at NCSA with artist parents, and there were yeah. certainly instrumentalists, classical instrumentalists at NCSA with classical instrumentalist parents. We have legacy students all over the school. Mm -hmm. Their parents were artists, and they mm -hmm. went there. Maybe they do that now. Maybe they don't. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's for sure a thing. Mm -hmm. But most of the students right. I talk to, their parents... I just recently talked to somebody who it was like, again, insurance came up. Right. Like, that is a thing. I've had people on this show who went to our school who imagine? now work insurance. Oof. And they like it. As you long know? As they're happy. Like, different stuff, you yeah. know? I, we used to joke at school about accountants. Like, right. that was the opposite of what we do. Right. Fair that amount of That seems much more interesting than, you know, some of the options to me. Yeah. I, I think in general, just like, you know, white collar paper pushing yeah. creates no. a lot of artist children. Clearly, none of us wanted that in our lives right or we wouldn't have gone to the school that we went to so what are your parents doing um my mom was a nurse with a specialty in uh it's called nurse anesthetist so she was like knocking people out yeah word up um and then is that as good a money as it is for an anesthesiologist because no. they roll in that shit right it's so crazy i'm under the impression from my mom that the nurse anesthetists are really, you know, like the rock what stars behind the scenes. It's a unnecessarily hard word it's to say. It's very hard to I'm, say. I'm watching you try, and I'm like, when I, don't I was a try. child, I butchered it every time. But now that I know the spelling, I try to say it with articulation. An English scholar would struggle to say that Anest word. I'm not even gonna try. That's a that's God smart. bless you. That's smart. Yeah. Um. So she did that for many but years. You're saying she was like the rock star of nurses. Yeah, and anesthesiologists kind of just like sit back and let the anesthetists do it. Really? That that was her, what That's she what said. she told it. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think also, like, there was some stories about her anesthesiologist superior who was, like, also an alcoholic and would just kind of, like, snooze because he I was mean, sleeping off his night, you know? It's famously 
a very highly paid job yeah. because of how dangerous what you're doing right. is, not because of how difficult the task is at hand. Yeah. You just got to set everything right and yeah. not fuck it up. Yeah. But if you do fuck it up, people die really easily. Right. So we're like, we're going to give you so much money. Right. Please, Please don't, don't make do any that. mistakes ever. Yeah. Like that's how much you get paid. It's just never fail. And while that sounds like a good deal, it definitely does set you up for like getting used to it. Right. You know, yep. even when it's such a high stakes thing, man, it becomes second nature yeah. to you. Mm -hmm. Think of the way we drive cars mm -hmm. with our knees and text totally. and shit. Because mm -hmm. we're like, I got this. Yep. It's so easy. And you're like, you have a weapon and pointed yet, at a bunch right. of other people. It's still but extremely we're like, dangerous. Absolutely. I recently looked up a bunch of stats because I had a very traumatic skiing experience. Oh, shit. And uh, you're more like, this is a hard left, but you're. Did you get hurt? I, my ego got hurt. Okay. Yeah. But my physical body was fine. Do you want to tell me what happened? <laughs> sure. Uh, but real quick on the stat. Right, 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 right. Very interesting, actually. I believe you. You have a, I'm not sure if these are the right stats. Like if they're actually, you know, scientifically proven stats. But well, we don't have a Jamie what, Vernon over here to look up our shit. Right. So we're what just going to have to roll with it. What I read is that you have a one in a hundred thousand chance of dying at a dance party. Okay. I don't know what would be a tramp, being trampled or like alcohol poisoning. I'm not sure. One of my friends died at a dance party when I was a kid. No. Yeah, that's true. Oh my gosh. It was a I've Halloween dance party. I've never party. heard of anybody we dying at a dance party. He had a heart condition. It was a very specific acute wow. situation. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's possible then. I just, um, so you actually you know that. somebody that it's happened to. I do know to, that guy. Right? So, <laughs> yeah. um, did, one in 100,000. But one in 100,000 is not that, like, that could happen to anybody. He's the only one I know. Okay. I don't right. know anybody, but yeah. I know one now. Um, I You have a one in like 64,000 chance of dying kayaking, which oh, I shit. did this year. Okay. And then you have like a one in 30,000. Then I should 000. say good job. Yeah, thanks. Here you are. Thank you. Yeah. I lived to tell the yeah, tale. Yeah, for sure. Um, in For skiing, I think you have like a one in a million chance of dying for with skiing. Really? It's and that I, safe? Yeah. Uh-huh. Unless this person was lying to me. It's so famously known as a dangerous right? sport. I thought so too. And I think that's that was my perception going into skiing. And I, I was completely traumatized. That's like if someone was like, yeah, but if you go base jumping, you almost never die. And, that's oh, like, that was what? the other one. I think like Paris, parasailing, parasailing. Not the base one. Base jumping, I think, is the one that's the jumping. single you most have, dangerous like, thing, you have right? Like a, little, a wingsuit. Yeah. That's not that's always true for base dangerous. jumping, but that. For sure makes sense. Like you have a very good chance of dying. Well, and especially because those guys are always trying to fly through things. Like forests? No, like openings and crevices. Oh, like they'll find <laughs> a mountains. like an entire forest. That would be fucking amazing. Maybe they do that. Probably not very well. I just don't know well. where they're doing it or. No, they'll find like a rock structure that has a, a hole in it. You that's know? like part like, of this thrill. And they'll try to like go through it. And it's like. Isn't that sound crazy? Like, did to you? Me, yes, but I was traumatized did, by skiing. So, did you see Fly? Uh, what is it? Solo? Free, solo, free solo. Of course, I didn't see it. You I'm not see it. remotely interested in that. And and one of the things that I love <laughs> is Amy Poehler's reaction. I can't remember what she, how she was on, but she made me laugh so hard. She was she went on a on like a talk show, maybe Seth, and she was like, "Do you know no one made him do that?" Yeah, he was like he, <laughs> he at any point that. he could have just not done it. Like, no one was like, you have to do this or, right? you know, we're going to uh -huh. like, no, it was nothing like that. Yeah. It was or you fully can't feature children or whatever. It was fully just his choice. And she was like, as soon as I figured that out, I was out. I was like, now we're just watching an idiot. This is someone who's just stupid. That's how I felt about everybody skiing. <laughs> Seriously. I was like, well, how could you put your children on the slope? So for a long, long time, you were super scared of skiing and then you went? I'm not even afraid of, I was never afraid of skiing. I just like, I think in my older age... We're the same age, so you might know what I'm talking about. I do. I think I'm. I think I'm risk averse. I'm more mm. risk averse than I used to be, for sure. I was much more willing to take a risk, like five years ago, probably like for sure ten years ago, like at NCSA. I was much more daring. I want to respond to that with my own experience, but first I want to hear the story the about what happened experience? to you skiing. It's not even that. It's not a crazy story at all. It's, it's all good. literally it's so traumatized you. It was so. Tra I I was really traumatized. It, and that's an important thing to note, just for a second. Like it doesn't, it doesn't have to yeah. sound traumatizing to me totally. or to whoever hears right. this to affect you that way. Yeah, for sure. Like you know, I'm not trying to give too much credit to things that you know maybe we should be a little tougher about. That happens too. Right. But 
shit can go down in the wrong right. way for the wrong person. Oh, yeah. And you're just like, uh, uh-huh. I recently, and, and this is what we'll come back to is when you, when you said that you're more risk averse, I'm not more risk averse, but I'm having these like anxieties and fears that I didn't used to have. Right. That are, I'm like, I thought if you didn't have this fear, you didn't then have you it. you don't have it. Yeah. Like claustrophobia can... is becoming a thing I'm dealing with. And oh, I no. never used to deal with it at because all. Because you remember how small those dorm rooms were that we were in? You had to live. I never had to live in one, but I totally, <laughs> oh, I was already they 21 so when I moved to town. So I, gotcha. I never was on campus. Um, but when I was a little kid, I used to like to get in boxes and stuff. Yeah. It was weird. And now yeah. it's like. Yeah, I tried to get in a sauna with somebody recently, and oh, it was like one of those little saunas. I was doing like an interview, and man, I almost had a panic attack. It was really bad. Interesting. Wow. Anyway, you're going skiing. Yeah, so let me preface the skiing thing by I realized my my new risk aversion because I was in Mexico, and I was expected to get on the back of this water sports banana float. Okay. Where they – I don't know if anybody has seen this. I've since seen it many times. It mm-hmm. keeps popping up in my life. But it's like a long – inflatable banana you sit on it yep. and there's a handle and then a boat pulls you at a rapid speed and then the boat like takes sharp turns so that the banana bounces over the waves from made by the boat and then it's yep. supposed to be very fun right so when i was like 15 20 25 that would have been like my definition of an amazing afternoon right yeah but i get on this banana i'm like thrilled because i know i'm gonna love it i love things like that i always have and then suddenly i'm on this banana and i'm like this is dangerous my life is in danger i have to get off of this banana so i'm like on the back of the banana yelling at the boat captain please stop like please stop the boat please stop the boat and whenever he would stop the boat i would just hop off the banana and get in the ocean the Mm -hmm. open ocean where i felt much safer that's crazy for somehow i was also bleeding profusely from the foot because I had stepped on a shell. What? So I felt safer in the ocean bleeding profusely from my foot than sitting on this inflatable banana. Which ocean? The Pacific Ocean. It was oh, on the West Coast. Oh, that's not a good co- one to be I leaking know. blood. I know. Yeah. I know. But at that, I felt much safer sw- treading water in the ocean leaking blood. When I was a kid growing up in Texas, we would go to the lake a lot. And exactly the practice of the banana boat that you're talking about is how you do water skiing and right. how you do inner tubing. It's all the same practice. Totally. You make waves with the boat and then you drag you the person the behind it yeah. across those waves. If the water itself is too choppy, you can't do it. You actually right. want still water that you're make making your the waves chop. on. Yeah. It's much safer. So... Uh, <laughs> It's funny that you say that. I'm curious how I would react to it now. But I remember when I was a kid, my dad is a real, less now, but when I was a kid, real, not thrill seeker guy, but he liked to just go fast in general. Like he was muscle cars, all Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And we had like a boat at one point and a sea do. It's so funny because my my family's like income level fluctuated so dramatically. Sometimes (laughs) we had lots of toys. Sometimes we didn't. And uh, this was one of the times when we had stuff, and my dad knew that when we went out on the sea dew and he put me in his lap, I would just hold the throttle down all the way and just go as fast as we could the whole time. And he would have to pull my hand off of it and be like, we have to slow down. We're going right. to need to turn and stuff. I just didn't get it. I just wanted to go as fast as possible. Yeah. So then when I got a little bit older and I started to be able to get on the inner tube behind the boat myself, my dad was like, oh, this motherfucker wants to go fast. We're about to. And he would sling me across the lake. I remember as a kid holding onto that thing so tight and flying so fast and crashing into those yeah. waves so hard. Yeah. I remember thinking, if I let go, I'll die. Ah, and as a kid, And as a kid, I was 0% scared by that. I was just like, I better hold on then. It's not true. Yeah. You won't. Right. You'll be okay. It's not a crazy unsafe practice. Is it possible to get really hurt doing that sure. if you do it wrong? Of course. Of course. But the feeling of coming up off a wake and slamming back into the water while the boat's pulling you at like 20 miles an hour is, it's hard. It's like a broken roller coaster. Yeah. It feels like you're on a roller coaster. And you're an responsible old for your one. own safety. Like, if on you a don't roller hold coaster, on, you're like, I'll at least die. you're fine. Like, you're relatively safe and i'm a disney world kid not the six flags kid. right so i was actually safe right you know if you i I remember thinking if i hit the water 
at the speed and force that the tube is hitting the water, I will. Die. It'll crack my skull open. It's not true, but it feels that intense when you're on it. So yes. I want to. I'm trying to back you up a little bit Thank and say you. that you're. It's not. I'm not. I'm not embarrassed or ashamed of sure. my recent risk aversion. Sure. But it's definitely happening. It's intimidating with what you're talking about. So you had the banana boat. So thing. I had the banana boat experience. So it. The banana told me that I'm less brave than I used to be. Got you. That's what it told me. When did so, you do this? Thanksgiving break. This most recent one? Yeah. Okay. That was when you did Banana Boat? Yeah. Okay. Then when did skiing happen? So then skiing happened over Christmas. Okay. <laughs> so approaching skiing, I'm thinking, okay, I don't like the cold. Like Austin is even a little chilly sometimes for me. Oh, man. Right? So I don't like the cold. I already am a little bit like, eh, is this a good idea? Probably not. It's fine. I've never been skiing. I'll do my best. Uh-huh. So- I'm already going in a, a little apprehensive, but I'm going to try and I'm like, I'm like an eat the weird food and, you know, like do the new experience. And I like that stuff. I Great. Like, I'm, yeah. Okay. I'm shaking my head because I'm the opposite. I'll always try it. That doesn't mean I'm going to like it. But like, I don't like to, I don't like to poo poo experiences or things that I haven't tried. Yeah. And I get that vibe from you. But at the same time, you explain it. And maybe it's because of the story you're about to tell. But there's also an energy of like. Don't make me try yeah. anything. You know what I mean? Like, yes. I don't want to be known as the person f- who won't try stuff, but please don't, please be nice. I'm like, I'm not ready to put like, myself through something crazy. And of the NCSA painful. kids, I am on the conservative side. Not you, politically. Not, right. Sure. But with my, like, life. <laughs> less, less mushroom doing in the woods for you during I, your time oh, at school. Oh, yeah. Like, I, the experimentation with, the, all of that like I started drinking at 21 mm-hmm. not because I have anything against it or I wasn't judgmental of the kids doing it 14 I just w- didn't want to mm. for many reasons yeah like for many reasons anyway so I'm no, on I the didn't conservative do until I was like 20 either I didn't do anything in high school at all yeah I never smoked weed I never got high uh, I never got drunk uh so th- that's like fairly unique, you know, like, yeah, it is. I'm one of the few people that has had an experience of not drinking till 21. And like I everybody at school smoked, at least when we were there. So like I tried a cigarette because mm-hmm. I didn't want to be the kid that was like telling oh, people they shouldn't smoke. But Winston not having Salem, tried North it. Carolina. Totally. Holy shit. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like R.J. Reynolds tobacco. I felt the same way that people feel about us about drinking late. I felt the same way, less now, uh, but did about people who had sex late. People were like, I lost my virginity when I was like 22 or 23. And you're like, how? Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, well, I just remember. And I I totally, that's what I used to compare it to. Because when people tell me, like, I can't believe you didn't drink until then. I was like, first of all, I've got alcoholism in my family that makes me really uncomfortable. Yeah. Also, I did start. I, I mean, I did have a little bit, and I just don't. I'm not in love with the way it makes me feel. Right. It's not my favorite feeling. Like, yeah, so I'm it's not, not a judgment, and it's not like you're going to hell. Or, and also, you know. I wasn't in the kind of social circles in high school that were drinking. Same. We were drinking coffee and hanging out, you know, yeah. at coffee shops and yeah. poetry jams and totally. stupid shit like that. Yeah. And so it just wasn't in my world. But the idea, in retrospect, of like not being like sexually active till I was like 21 or 22. I it's can't crazy. even fathom I know. that. Same. Like, it's absolutely I don't know how one nuts. goes to NCSA and doesn't become sexually active at a young age. Oh, they don't. <laughs> unless unless they're, uh, they have a significant other at another school, whatever Do that you, may or may not fake? be. Maybe. <laughs> maybe they are or maybe they're not. Or maybe it's- um, At Interlochen? And yeah, this is a thing. This is a thing that I think for sure happens. I think people hold on to relationships that they had before they got to NCSA to yeah, keep themselves right. safe right. from getting involved in shit at school. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't always work. work out. No, sometimes it does. You think? Yep. I know people who are still with the person that they started dating before they went to school. They went to school for four years without that person also there, and they are still with that person and will probably marry them. I don't think I can think of anybody in I that I think situation. of two off the top of my head, wow. and I bet there's more. Of course, I'm sure there's more. And a lot of people tried to do what they did. Right. And like, you know, kept their high school boyfriend or yep. whatever. And it was always like, and they're always somehow, and they're, of course, they're always like the extra hot ones too. Cause you're like, they're, they're the least available of anybody right. who's at school yeah. because they've got that like 
Christian boyfriend they right. met when they were in second grade and shit. Yeah, it's like all the girls I know on Dancing with the Stars, all the dancers, they're all from Provo, right. Utah. Yeah. They're, all they're all married to guys they yeah. met when they were five yep. and shit. Uh huh. It's crazy. Yeah. I can't relate to that at all. So no. I have no idea what that experience is like. No. But anyway. I so. did I did have the experience which was like something very um unique to NCSA. Sure. I was dating a guy Josh Brocky. Mm-hmm. I was dating him in high school, and then we continued our relationship into college. But we were at NCSA in both cases. Wow! So that's like a different. But we yeah. still, it was still the same problems. Right. It was still like, oh, all these new girls, like, oh, oh he's got eyes for all of them. You know, hundred percent. And yeah. neither of you are uh, hard to look at. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that makes it tough for both of you. Josh is very handsome, and he's gotten handsomer. Yeah. To be honest. Yeah. He's, yeah. He was he, handsome then, and he's more handsome now. And he knows he's gonna I think continue that. So. To, he's going to continue oh, yeah. to upset men and women with oh, how yeah. much more handsome he gets. Totally. Like the salt and pepper hair. It's like. Uh, see, like I'm remaining better. young looking instead of evolving into an older, like distinguished yeah. guy. I'm just not going past the 25 year old right. looking man. You do look, yeah, you look the same. Yeah, but I'm worried that one day it's just going to be like whoosh, falls it's off possible. like really hard. You know what I mean? Maybe. You're but like, that's going to be. Man, he's like 38. He looks 26. And then he turned 39 or 40. No and it was just like he looks 56. Nah. Yeah, it'll I think be there's at a least, good chance. It'll be like 60. I keep 60. taking my Paul Rudd Maybe vitamins. Like 72. There you go. You'll be fine for a while. I you don't even have gray I hair. Could, I could go ugly at 72. Yeah, so you've got That's fl- fine. you got 40 years. What happened to you when you were skiing, god damn it? Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, you don't have to apologize. The fact that I got you too makes me feel good. It's always yeah, my back fault to when it. that happens. We're back to it. Um so the first day, so I was with a group a large group of people. And the first day, um one of them was like, "Okay, we're just going to go up to the top of this intermediate mountain." This is in Jackson Hole, by the way, which is supposed to be like extremely difficult skiing. So we're like, go to the top of this intermediate mountain. I guess that's a blue. I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know skiing. I know double black diamond is the worst. Yeah, this wasn't that. Got it. Or the best if you're a good skier. That's a good point. So perspective. Um, But they they were like, okay, we're going to go up to the top of this intermediate hill. No big deal. We'll just... Easily ski down it. You're going to be a natural. It's going to come really easily to you. No prob. And I was like, okay. I was like, shouldn't you show me how to stop myself? Right. But I didn't get any instruction. So we proceed down the hill, and I am completely the opposite of a natural skier. I have no idea what to do with my body. And I'm a violinist. And have violinists... you done any skiing? No. This is your first time ever? They didn't even give you a bunny slope half hour? Correct. Got to do the bunny slope half Correct. hour, yo. Yeah, I know. I know Pizza that now. Pizza and French fries. I know that now. Oh, man. Yeah, and like a bourbon by the fire, and yeah. then like bunny, and then bourbon at the fire, and then bunny. Yeah. That's what I should have done. Well, pizza and French fries is how you make your skis, <laughs> so you know when to stop and then I know straight. that now, yeah. but I learned that like much after the fact. So I didn't know how to do anything, so like we end up with Sounds him like having to like- Sounds like someone does edibles, and they're like, you can handle yeah. like totally like 50 milligrams. And you're then like, you're stuck- right like that for eight hours right right. so basically i was stuck because i was at the top of the hill and i had to get down the hill right that's the only option so he skied behind me holding me the whole way because i couldn't do it on my own every time i would do it on my own one of my friends gotcha skiing on my own was not an option right so he was behind me the whole way and had to do it that way or i would like be on the verge of a panic attack and be like starting to cry and then he, we would continue together and then I so much like a trip I would like try to do it again by myself and then like start to cry and then continue together wow. so we get to the bottom of the mountain finally and I was like I have to leave this place right I can't have skis on my feet I can't have this helmet on my head it's like 85 pounds of gear I want the whole experience to be over in every yeah. way yeah like I have to go yeah. do something else right now by myself for sure so like I took all the gear off I'm like trying to fight back the tears I go to the fire and read my book do you feel embarrassed at all true true question I mean was there shame involved in how you experienced it or were you more angry at the people for putting you through it like what what were you going through I was disappointed in myself because I consider myself willing to try things but you did try it I tried it didn't like, like it do you feel like you weren't trying by hating it I think that I think my problem was that my body was having such a physical reaction, like I was going into panic mm-hmm. that I couldn't push p- 
past it enough to give it really like my all. You what know? does your physical anxiety feel like? <sighs> I've been thinking about that lately because I never noticed it. And lately I started realizing what my symptoms are when I right. get truly right. onset anxiety, which again, new thing. Didn't just happen to me when I was younger. I have a different experience than you in that I have a true like clinical phobia Okay. That I've dealt with since I was a baby, like since I was a kid, since of I have what? memories. Um, it's a complicated phobia because it's really rare. I, I'm under the impression that it's rare, but I think it's actually not as rare as I think. But okay, I word. I was the only person that I ever had heard of having it. And like my, I doubt my parents would ever watch this, but they really made me feel bad about myself for it. Like sure. it was a huge point of shame and contention in our house because they basically didn't want to acknowledge that it existed yeah. so they just pretended it didn't Good and that people was people do that yeah, all the time of course and that was hard for me um and so like only recently am i even willing to talk about it um and i've like i would say there's only like three or four people in my life that know about it because i don't need to tell people unless i'm going to be in certain situations with them where it's relevant for them to know right. so like i tell significant others now but only like maybe one or two of my friends knows. But I'm open to talking about it. It's just not something that was a big part of my like experience being open about as a child right. or an adult. But I, I've had it my whole life. So it's an it's a phobia of um, personally vomiting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not afraid. Like if you had to vomit right now. Right. It would not make me panic unless I thought I was going to catch something from you. Does that make sense? You're worried about someone else's, like, contagious diseases? Yeah. I'm worried about catching something that's going to make me vomit. So it has a name. Oh. It's, like, a clinical thing. But there's people with different levels of it. Like, there's people who can't be around somebody vomiting. There's people that can't see vomit on the street No wonder you whatever. don't fucking drink. Yeah, I know, right? That makes so much sense. Yeah. Because that's the, that, that. that's the result of doing that too mm -hmm. hard. Mm -hmm. Do you know I've never thrown up from drinking ever? Me neither. Wow, what's up? We might be the only people we know ever <laughs> I know. in the world. And that's why, you know, like I would have pushed past that had I not had this issue that kept me I don't me think from I, I would definitely, do, it wouldn't rise to the level of a clinical phobia, but I certainly, that is a huge part of why I don't over drink. Because right. it's and not never pleasant. And like, the feeling of nausea. Right. There's lots of things that I can tolerate and I'm willing to deal with. Yeah. And there are some things that I'm like, just don't ever make me have to feel this way. Yeah. And it's crazy. But like, nobody that's... wants to vomit. That's the thing. Right. But plenty of people could give a fuck. Right. Pe are... Plenty of people have drank to, drank to the point of knowing that's going to happen. And there it's are so many deal. people who accept yeah. that as part of their evening. Yeah. Right. They don't want to do it. Right. But what are you going to do? It's, Not do it's it? Like it. Yeah. us? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lame. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like. Yeah, that's absolutely a thing. But I have a thing that kicks off in my brain when I'm drinking, which is not very much or very often. But when it does happen. But it stops you. Yeah. Yeah. It just goes, you're done, dude. Yeah. You just stood up and got that rush that you get when you've been sitting for a while and drinking and you stand yeah. up and you're like, oh, that's okay, enough. then I'm feeling it. Yeah. And when that happens to me, there's no part of me that's like. Oh, let's uh, try this some more. Let's right. keep this going. Yeah. Well, we're like in that way. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so because I've always dealt with that, I've always known what anxiety feels like. Right. But I only started having anxiety outside of that very specific thing um, at like maybe during college. Like, sure. I think when I when I knew that I that college was coming to an end, I started to have general anxiety which before I just had one spe very specific phobia with a really like ag aggressive symptoms, mm -hmm. but um, it was very few and far between that it would come up. You know, it would only come up if like my sibling was sick or like, I don't know, when you're a kid, people vomit around you a lot. But yeah, when you're an adult, it doesn't happen that much. But now that I'm adult, I have general anxiety based on other triggers. Right. So I'm dealing with both now. Yeah. A hundred percent. But I've always known what anxiety felt like and I've always known what panic felt like. What does it feel like to you in a so physical for, way? Yeah, for me. So it's your body, it's kind of like if you don't have enough sleep and you've been drinking a lot of coffee. So okay, like, yeah. it's like a slightly, your body's a little sweaty, clammy, hot, but also a little shivery. And for me, it's like my chest feels very tight. 
my heart goes really fast. Um, and it's just like a feeling of impending doom, <laughs> you know, like. Yes, that is very similar to what I experience. I don't necessarily feel hot as much as I feel really fucking cold. And I don't feel interesting. I don't feel cold on my arms, which is where I, you normally feel cold first. Right. Yeah. Like that's where you first start. That's why people do this, because like the first place you feel the coldness is usually on the arms. And yeah. you're just like, oh, wow, it's cold in here. This coldness that comes from me feeling super anxious and scared comes from inside my chest. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I'm like, <coughs> I don't I don't know how to get warm. I start putting on jackets. Oh, for wow. Real because I'm like, I, I'm shaking. Do you recognize this as anxiety or do I you? I didn't used to. I do now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I do. Yeah. Um, it definitely happens under under circumstances where uh you know i don't really have anything that i get in trouble for anymore or get caught with yeah but it is that same feeling you totally. know it's that yeah. like my parents got home mm -hmm. before i thought they would and they're gonna see the thing yeah and i'm racing home on my bike yeah. trying to catch them from seeing the thing that i don't want them to see. it's that feeling. it's definitely that feeling it's like your head's Ugh. like a little swimmy and you don't feel you feel a little out of sorts. And or... you want someone to tell you, like, the thing that you're most worried about is not even going to happen ever. Not like, it's going to be okay. Fuck you. It's not going to be okay. Tell me the thing yeah. that I'm worried about that I may not even be able to describe to you in right. detail because it's not fully conscious yet. But someone needs to tell me right now that that's not going to happen. Yeah. And, yeah, I never used to... Teenager? Fuck no. Yeah, I, I didn't have anything like that. Yeah. It was, you know, a little angst and a little worry but never that like, you know, only with my parents, only yeah. with getting in trouble. Yeah. Not with peers. And mm -hmm. now it happens with just other adults mm -hmm. where someone says something about me or something. And I'm like, so generally, I don't give a fuck what people think. Yeah. But someone says something that hits me in the wrong way. I'm like, oh, no, maybe they're right. <sighs> what a spiral of mm -hmm. feeling like wrapped up in it. Can you get out? Do you have ways to get out of it? Or you just have to let it dissipate. The coats help. So you Warming warm yourself myself up. up in a physical way. That's really interesting. I've gone and sat in my car before and turned up the heat really high. Huh. To make myself to the point of like not wanting to wear a shirt hot. Mm -hmm. And that will calm me down. Because it wow. is literally like my, it's like, you know, when you're cold and you, you uh, concave a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. And you just like kind of collapse your chest and you're pulling your like arms together. Like you need together. to be able to relax your body. And I need to be able to open up my chest yeah. and take really deep breaths and both of those things feel like they're getting harder to do. Mm -hmm. And so making my body physically warm yeah. will do it. Take a shower, mm. like a hot shower, that'll kind of fix it. Mm -hmm. But even then I feel a little bit like I'm trapped yeah, right. in the shower. In the box. Yeah, I was like, thinking that with the sauna. You uh -huh. can't use a sauna to warm up. Oh my God, I almost had a panic attack. It was exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. And I was like Were you almost cold? convulsing. Yeah. Whoa. And I was shirtless and like Whoa. in a towel in this sauna. Wow. And I was like, I mean, I felt hot on my extremities. That but is I felt really the cold closing thing in my right. chest fighting it, like what you're talking about. It's, yeah, being it's so cold, funny that I didn't fix it. Yeah. What I just said, that's so weird. The sauna thing. Well, that's, that was where my mind wow. went. I, didn't I was thought like, about man, that not even in a sauna. Not even I'm in, in a, a sauna. sauna and it was on and I was ready for it. And I was like, that's part of that actually. And she kept saying, we can turn it down. And I was like, I am from Texas. Right. The heat, heat is, is you could make it 115 yeah. in here. Mm -hmm. I could deal with it. I could yeah. just like a dry heat. Yeah. Does fine. not bother me. Right. I'm bothered by the fact that you keep closing the door. Yeah. Tiny box. Yeah. And I was like, I, I had to go outside and like Did walk you, like, around a little bit and, and come back in. Yeah. I was so <clears throat> fucking embarrassed. Oh, deeply shame because of the other person or just she invited me there to do a podcast that she does. That's in a sauna. And I was like, yeah, sure. This is great. And I love to sweat. Yeah. Like I really do like it. Not Texas. under the wrong circumstances, but a good healthy sweat. Same. Yeah. So yep. do it. Mm hmm. Oh, man, I was so psyched, too, and she was so nice, and I felt like I was holding her up. You know, we made an appointment, and I was like, I just need a minute, and I was like, she didn't give a fuck, but I was just like, because she had someone else coming later, and I was like, well, come on, dude, and I'm over there like, trying to talk myself out of it. I was so scared, Yeah. and I was like, what is going to happen, dude? Right, but it's not it's rational. Not about that. Yeah, no, it's, it's not so rational. hard. And if I could talk myself out of my phobia, trust me, I would have done that a long time ago. It's gotten a lot better, though, I honestly. have a friend of mine who is a neuro-linguistic programming coach. Do you know what that is? 
No. So I'm actually doing a new like podcast therapy. that I'm I'm kind of plugging here. It is a version of therapy. Um, we're going to be doing it every week and putting out episodes where she explains how it works and then does it on me on Whoa. the show. Neurolinguistic programming, and you'll have to watch the show to get a much better explanation. I'm the layman on the show. Is all about reprogramming the triggers in your brain and the stories that you tell yourself in that split moment of mm. subconscious mm -hmm. analysis. You know, mm -hmm. you think about a certain thing. It's very helpful with PTSD. Right. Specifically people who have like wartime issues. Every time they hear a bell, yeah. they hear a bomb drop. Yeah. What she does is goes in and changes what your reaction to the bell is. Mm -hmm. And this thing that you don't know how to reprogram and it's very good with habits mm -hmm. like smoking, mm -hmm. nail biting, mm -hmm. and it's very good with phobias where you yeah. have a kind of irrational fear of this whatever. thing that's whatever mm -hmm. and it's caused by right. whatever your trigger is. Yeah. Her expertise is in finding what that trigger is mm -hmm. that you may not even realize is what's setting it off. Yeah. And she couples that with the use of the Enneagram. Do you know what that is? Yes. So it's like the a nine types or whatever. Right. Person, It's a personality assessment. Right. She uses that early in the process to get a good idea of how she's people dealing function. <laughs> yeah. And then that helps her figure out, okay, your triggers are probably in this neighborhood because you're mm -hmm. very focused on this, that, or the other. And I am um, positive that this is directly linked to my personality. Positive. Yeah. It's no, like it is. the same piece of me that is attracted to the violin. For Say more. sure. What does that mean? To me, it's 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 not perfectionism necessarily. It's more of like excellence, cleanliness, um, consistency, being able to anticipate things, having organization. Like the violin is such a methodical, difficult, challenging, but then when you accomplish it, very rewarding, and then it becomes pretty predictable and you like are able to do something that's very um demanding and mentally stimulating but you're like it's your zone and you kind of like get the hang of it and like it's still challenging but it's you know what to expect does it resonate to you that it and as i've thought about this for a long time the violin to me has always felt like the ballet of instruments i think yeah i almost see a ballerina a lot of times when I hear violin or when I, I see people playing it, I yeah, think of like a I ballet so solo. It's really interesting that you say that. You should finish your thought, but I have another one. No, I love it. I was just going to say like just echoing all the shit you just said, like yeah. precision. Pre There's yeah. a right way to do it. Yeah. There is a level of perfection that is fucking that hard. That you'll never reach. Yeah. So you always get to like work towards it. You're always like like on the path towards right. something it's like a never-ending journey but it's very rewarding along the way and there are the multiple sides right there's the classical approach to getting something that is impossible to perfect but that standard is there mm -hmm. you can also turn it into a fiddle yeah you know it's like there is a way to play with it mm -hmm. in lots of different ways mm -hmm. but there's still that thing and mm -hmm. it's like you know a banjo yeah. Let's talk about another totally instrument different personality just do well yeah but it just also doesn't have that like <laughs> yeah how do you play a banjo perfectly right like yeah. hit the notes right, sure, right. but like and it also just like the rootsy raw quality is kind of like what people like about the banjo, but with the right. violin, it's that lyrical. It's like yeah. the lines, the lines in the music are so similar to lines in classical dance to yeah. me. Right. Um, but what was your thought you had off of that? So I've always felt that way, and I've always like one of my best friends from NCSA is um, a professional ballerina and she was a ballerina in NCSA. Um, who's that? Sarah Watson was her maiden name and now she's Sarah Harkins. She married Peyton Harkins who's a guitarist. Cool. From NCSA. But, which is adorable. Um, but she, I've been watching her dance for years now and obviously we're all exposed to ballet at NCSA and get to go see the productions and that's an amazing um, privilege. Mm-hmm. But so I've been watching her for years and I, I saw a lot of parallels in what it physically takes to play the violin and what it physically takes to do ballet. Not the sport of it, not the athleticism necessarily of ballet, but the precision and some of the some of the motions to me look really similar. Like ballerinas are all doing yes, this kind of stuff. That's what I'm to me it's the same as violin. So I actually talked to Sarah about that over the last couple of years, and we collaborated on a workshop for my violin students where she came in, and we like 
kind of drew some parallels and used her um, expertise as a ballerina to help my students Mm. in what ways there are crossover. So we talked a lot about like stacking the spine and balance and posture and how some of the openness of the arms in ballet and the drop of the shoulders and the tall head have a um, have a parallel with playing the violin and can really help. Actually, you guys do like a performance together where you play and she no, dance. We have done that. Amazing. That it was really adorable. I don't doubt that at all. She. Uh, it was something where like Peyton wrote the music and then I performed the music and like she danced the music and it was like written about their love and it was like the most cute, beautiful NCSA thing of all time. That sounds like some project love shit. Yeah. Was it? <laughs> no. No. Strangely enough, it wasn't. But uh, I don't know. My point is just that I think violin attracts a certain type of person and I think ballet probably attracts that the, athle- the athlete version of that type of person. What do you, you know? think is the difference between someone attracted to violin and someone attracted to the cello? Violin, well, strings att- attract a certain type of person, but sure, but those are the two big ones that draw the fuck totally, out of people. Totally, and like that are like, I want to play that. Right, even though strings attract a certain type of person, each instrument, like there is definitely a type attracted to the individual instruments right. even like bass is oh, a very specific bass players have the best weed oh man Do you know that yeah right that's 100%. a bass that's a bassist thing 100%. and they're like the quiet hot types in yep. the orchestra right they're always quiet but they're always sexy and they're right? always high and it's the best those are my favorite kinds of people <laughs> quiet, quiet and hot high. and stoned man welcome to the club <laughs> that's so funny i'm two out of three and of those so things true. most of the time <laughs> Uh, not quiet. Should, nope, almost never. Um, uh, what'd you ask me? Violinist versus jealous. So, right. violinists, and I, I see this primarily in my students. Okay. Um, <clears throat> violin attracts. Okay, this is interesting, and you see this in professionals as well. Right. Male violinists are usually very flashy, outgoing, daredevil showman types. But women violinists are usually a certain amount of refined, drawn to excellence, perfectionists, type A, mm-hmm. clean, organized. Um, the kind of chicks they make romantic comedies about. <laughs> you know what I mean? You ever notice that's like always the romantic comedy is the chick who's just so busy and so type A. <laughs> yeah. And she just needs like Matthew McConaughey to tell her to slow down a little right, bit, you yeah. know? Uh-huh. Those are the violinists, <laughs> yeah. you know? So, yeah. Uh, cellists, um, men and women, I usually find more consistency in the men and women cellists than I do in the men and women violinists. Mm. Okay. They're usually a little bit more sensual, open-minded, um, passionate. I would say if cellists are more passionate than violinists. <laughs> Do you think it has anything to do with the way you guys fucking stand and sit when you play the instrument? Cause, Maybe. Man, one of them is all about like this dope ass classical posture, and then the other one's all about like hunched over playing something between your legs. Like it's I think a totally for the, different vibe. I think vibe. for the women, it's definitely relevant. Mm. Right, because they have to. They basically are sitting in a power. You know, power posing. No, I don't know what that means. Th- there's a TED talk called like power posing or something, Word and up. and it comes. We've discussed it in the violin community a lot because um, you ha- like violinists also are usually kind of introverted physically. And one thing I experience with teaching children is having to get them to be willing to open their bodies. Right, right, like, right, right. For example, kids don't want to go forward with their arm. What do you? I don't know. What you to mean bow by that. with the violin, you have to go forward. Kids want to bring it to the side of their body so they oh. can stay in their bubble. Right. So we work a lot on literally just being able to shake somebody's hand and then you can bow because you're willing wow. to go out front of your body. That's so interesting. So with power posing, the idea is instead of like, like I might have a tendency to want to sit like this. Right. But if I sit like this, I'm going to feel more confident and I'm going to fool my mind into feeling like I'm more confident because my body's in a confident position. That's super interesting. So the women cellists are sitting with their legs spread. Right. And open shoulders. 
right? So like that's going to make them feel more powerful just by virtue of the pose. Their body is going to feel powerful. So it's going to like trick their mind. You know, what's crazy to me is that only because I got into like a certain conservatory with acting, which is not even the thing I was there to do. I ended up in this program that taught me how to use my body so much more efficiently yeah. just for walking around and talking to people. That program, that acting program is amazing. I mean, it's great, but it's just insane to me. I'm like, that is not an acting thing. That but is a person thing. It's a person thing. Yeah. We should be teaching should be, that yeah. in like eighth, ninth, and tenth grade right. in a row all right. three years mm-hmm. where it's like, Okay, you little weirdos who are growing hair and shit and growing like a foot in six months. Mm -hmm. Let me teach you how your spine works. Yeah. And like how your, you know, abdomen and chest come together in this way with your back that creates this like six sided thing that can open in all directions. And, you know, you're in choir and they're like, breathe. And they're like, but don't push, push up your shoulders. Right. And that's the end of the conversation. Right. If yeah. you're in choir mm-hmm. about how to breathe in a healthy way, it's not just about performance. Like right. learning to breathe into your back. Mm-hmm. Who the fuck even knows about that? Yeah. It's like not even a thing most people talk about. There mm-hmm. are people. Unless you're in singing lessons or drama class or whatever. Right. And you happen to be there and get that lesson mm-hmm. when it's like, how many different issues I mean I'm still like I'm not sitting with great posture right now but there is an awareness right now that is keeping me from later getting up going oh yeah because I'm like I'm still sitting in a certain way that's different if I had never taken those fucking classes yeah it just seems to me like so much of what we learned at that school that I feel like again it's so strange we're talking about it but so much of what we learned at that school that people really respond to doesn't even have anything to do with what they want to learn how to do in the long run in a big picture. It's a yeah. good, helpful tool. Yeah. But you're just like, oh, man, empathy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Totally. I you're mean, like, I learned everything that I really the, – the reason that I would recommend in CSA to people outside of – the teachers are phenomenal and it's like a little hidden gem in, no, in the middle of nowhere, North Carolina. What I learned there had nothing to do with playing the violin. You know, like I had a phenomenal experience in my classical studies, Mm -hmm. but I had a much more touching and moving experience outside of that. Right. You know, and I am who I am today partially because I went there, honestly. Oh, I think it's hard to yeah say that you wouldn't be. But is that true about all college? You know, maybe. You don't think so? Nope. Absolutely not. I don't think it means that we that you can't get that experience somewhere else. I think you totally can. Yeah. I think there's so many different things. Here's here's what I think makes a difference. I think that any program, school, whatever, technical school, whatever you do, how much you get out of it is dependent on like two things. How much do they ask of you? Mm-hmm. And then how much do you give? Mm-hmm. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's really all it comes down to. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of schools don't ask very much of you. Right. In the big spectrum, you know, they might Mm -hmm. ask you for one difficult paper from time to time. Mm -hmm. You might have a difficult class or lab a Mm -hmm. little bit, especially if all that's very unfocused. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's asking very much of you. That's like more high school. Right. Some people might be affected by that. I'd love to talk to those people about how they were. I I don't totally understand how that would work. That's why I want to talk to them. Mm Mm-hmm. But when a school, you know, it's like people who go to med school Mm -hmm. and then later they're different. Mm -hmm. It's fucking hard. Mm -hmm. Like it asks so much of you. And then how much do you give back? Mm -hmm. Do you give as much as you possibly can? That doesn't make you better or worse than someone who doesn't or Mm -hmm. chooses not to. I'm not placing any judgment. Mm -hmm. But you want to talk about how much you change. Right. I think the change comes from a lot being asked of you and you making a choice either to give or not. And... Like my experience in particular was I was searching for a place to give a lot to. That's what I wanted. Yeah. I wasn't going there because it was the next thing to do. I wasn't there because I knew about it when I graduated high school. I didn't. Um, You know, a lot of reasons that draw people to that school were not my story. Mm -hmm. My story was I need a place that will let me go fucking ham. I need something that's going to let me do 16 hours a day. 
Yeah. And I'm kind of picky about what I want to do 16 hours a day. Yeah. So if you're going to make me do math for like eight of those 16 hours, I don't want to go. Yeah. And if you're going to only ask eight hours a day of me, I'm going to get bored. Yeah. So I need something where I can do stuff I really like all all day long. Yeah. And and I'll go home and work on it. Mm -hmm. I don't need a lot of time to not be doing this. Yeah. That made it a good fit for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that until Mm -hmm. I ended up there. But that also allowed me the opportunity to get a lot out of it. Yeah. Because I was like, I'm ready. constant. Give it to me. Mm -hmm. And I also brought into it an attitude of, I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And I'm not qualified to be here. I always had that insecurity. Really? I'm not good enough. Yeah. But I I was like not letting that get in the way too much because I was like, I made it in. Yeah. They said yes. So let's not, you know. Right. It's like when you're hooking up with someone who's way hotter than you, you're like, (laughs) I don't feel like I'm supposed to be here right now, but they let me in and here we are. Uh Uh-huh. So let's, yeah, let's just play it like you deserve to be here, dude. Let's just play it like it's, be cool. And that is how I totally spent school, which was just like, yeah. Hey man, they said yes. Right. Maybe you tricked them. Probably not. They're way smarter than you. And if they say, and that's part of me accepting what they had to say. Yeah. Was when they were saying, you're good enough to be here. Right. I was like, I don't totally buy that, but I trust you more than I trust me. Yeah. That's why I'm here. Yeah. Is to buy more information and experience mm-hmm. from you. Uh, so if you say I'm good enough, okay. Yep. And what else? Mm-hmm. And they're like, do this. And I'm like, that sounds weird. And they're like, just do it. And I'm like, I'm here. Yep. Let's do it. And a lot of other people would be like, I'm not doing that. What? Right. That didn't make any sense to me. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, because you don't know anything. Right. That's why you're here. Yeah. If you them. already knew, you wouldn't need to be here. Mm-hmm. What are we paying and for? And yet people had that attitude. So much. <laughs> the, so, so the much. Ego. <laughs> well, it's a little bit of ego. Ego. It's a little bit of, as we were talking about earlier, entitlement. Yeah. Which is like, they've always been the best. That's how they ended up at the school right. of the people who are the best. It makes yeah. sense. Yeah. But the idea that just because you were the best in fucking Minnesota or mm-hmm. whatever, I'm not talking about anyone in particular. I just made that up. I immediately thought of Ethan Nienaber and I was like, fuck, he's going to hear this. And be, I'm not, I love you, buddy. I didn't mean you. I just made that up. Um, but just because you were the best wherever you're from. Right. It, it pre-qualifies you in no way other than to say that you're allowed to be at the school. Mm-hmm. And you could very well be the worst one here. Yeah. You know? And they like, might kick you out. <laughs> yeah. For being the worst one here because yeah. we only got so many spots, bro. Mm-hmm. And I'm okay with that too, mm-hmm. actually. Um, but I think that there is something so valuable in just turning yourself over to something. And as someone who always felt like they had something to say and always felt like they had an opinion, I finally was like, what if I just didn't say them for a little while? What if I just shut the fuck up? And everything that they're like, do this. And I'm like, it's weird. What if you just didn't say it's weird and right. you just, just did do it? Just do it. What's going to happen? Yeah. Except that you might learn something. Right. And I was like, oh, fuck. And change and, in a positive way. And holy fuck. Like, it took a high caliber institution telling me I was good enough to give that a shot. Right. Because I had gone through most of my life being like, I think I'm valuable. And most people being like, but your report card says you aren't. Right. And I'm like, Okay. I'm not really sure what we do here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's crazy to me how so many people at that school end up there for different reasons and take different things away from it. But I am – you seem to me like the kind of person who, even though you didn't want to go there for the longest time and finally did, that you appreciate the fuck out of the fact that totally. you went there oh, yeah. in a totally non-entitled way. Thank you. Does that feel true for you yeah, or am I, mean, I just giving the compliment? No, I, no, I was always like, I'm, I still am the violinist who's like, I'm somehow getting away with people thinking I'm a violinist. Just crazy. <laughs> I still feel that way every day. Not, that's not to say that I don't think that I'm qualified to be a professional violinist. Do you know what I consider to be a violinist? I'm not going to even add the word professional. Someone who can play the violin. Right. Well, Period. There are profession there are violinists much better than me. Of course. That are not qualified to be professional violinists. And there are people like me who I'm not at that level, but there are things about me outside of my violin playing that make me able to be a professional violinist. 
Like what? Like being able to show up on time, look professional. Oh, I see what you see. So you're talking about the, the blazer. contract. Yeah. Right. That's all it takes. You bring quite a bit to the table. <laughs> Velvet. Yeah, for sure. No, I understand what you mean. That's, um, you know. Responding to emails on time. I mean, there's a lot, like, there's a lot, th- there's a lot of things that I can directly um, say are responsible for my having been able to make a career as an artist that have zero to do with making good art. Mm. Seriously. You know, and I think some people would get upset about that. And what I don't... Those people uh, might not be working. <laughs> that's a really good point. Um, and no offense. Th- no. To any of them. No I don't judgment. think... Obviously, you're not offended. But, you know, I think there's a lot of artists out there that don't feel like they should have to do the, that stuff. No wrong. You know, like, I'm making amazing art. Where is the money? Well, and what they don't understand, I think, I would venture to say is how the most important commodity in the world functions, which is people's attention. There is no more important thing, whether you want to sell something or make something or write a song or run for office or, you know, fuck, what? Like, what do you want to do? Get married and have a family that does not require the ability to capture people's attention or at least a person's attention one at a time. That is the skill set that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about, you know, taking care of your brand. I I am talking about that. But even just the ability to be in a room. I remember when I was, man, I was was 19, I think, in my first job at HEB here in Austin. And I went in for an interview. It was like a group interview. You know, it was a bunch of people that bottom of the barrel people looking for work you know mostly high school and stuff yeah and I went in and everybody else in the group interview got a bagger job and it was like 750 an hour Mm -hmm. and I got one of the checker jobs Mm. like right out the gate and it was 850 an hour people skills (laughs) that's all it was yeah it was my ability because we had to act out like it was kind of funny we had like a little improv Where they were like, what if this was happening? How would you deal with it? And it was like someone dropped some groceries or this is going on. But also this is going on over here. So how do you deal with it? What do you do? Mm -hmm. And I don't remember what the fuck I did or what anybody else did. But I do remember everyone else in there being super nervous. Right. And they were like, "Uh, I don't. uh, uh." And I was like, I just go pick up the groceries that fell down and give them back to the lady and be like, hey, yeah, have Have a a good good day. day. Sorry about that. (laughs) To me, it felt like the bare minimum, and I was a little nervous. Right. I had never had a job before. Right. So I was like- But to you, it was obvious, and to them, it's not. So that's why you're the checker. Exactly. And again, I don't think it says anything better or worse about me other than the fact that I understood even then what it means to have people's attention and to not blow it. Yeah. And I think the sooner that people can start wrapping their brains around that, you know, it's like- or, and this is maybe the key because this is another way around that, right? If you are a super introverted person and mm-hmm. you play the fuck out of the violin and you just want to be appreciated and make money playing the violin and you also don't want to fucking talk to people, you don't like people, get yourself hooked up with someone else who has that skill set. Yeah. And or can- be good enough at the violin that that's all you need. <laughs> yeah, but that's, man, that's- how fucking good at the violin would you, you have, have to, to be? You have to be the best. Yeah, you have to be like in the top couple hundred. Yeah, so like we're not even talking to those people. Those people aren't listening to this. I don't give a fuck. Like I'm, if you're a full-on genius prodigy, right, you're yeah. dealing with a different set of stuff. I'm right. talking about if you're pretty fucking good, but you're not a people person and you don't want to do social media, yeah. you know, and you don't want to push on LinkedIn your professional skills or mm-hmm. whatever. I get that, but... Get yourself within a group of people where yeah. someone else does have that skill set. Right. And they are do have the gift of gab or they do have the gift of entrepreneurship. Like yeah. surround yourself with other people who can tolerate your lack of social skills mm-hmm. and like you in mm-hmm. spite of it maybe. Mm-hmm. And are like, oh, we got to bring Kenny along because he's the best. And they're like, I've never heard of him. Like, you don't even need to talk to him. Just hire just him and let him play the fuck out of the violin and then send him home with the money. Yeah. And he, it's going to be great. And you just need that person to make that statement for you. Yeah. And if you can get that on a reliable way. I mean, I know people, 
you know, as a comedian, I know other comics who are struggling to do whatever they want. Because this is the other thing, I think, especially with comedy and maybe even with violin. People, I think, get a little hung up on the idea that everyone has the same goals and they fucking don't. Right. That is a big That's thing that very happens. very true. People are like, you know, it's like when I was growing up doing, and this goes all the way back, when I was growing up doing theater and then I was going off to school, I really wanted to direct. And uh, I never really... Being a famous actor was never on my list. Yeah. It was never something I wanted to do. I did act in plays in high school. Everyone I knew when I was leaving high school was like, can't wait to see your name in lights, see you in Hollywood, see you on TV and stuff. And I was like so bothered right. for like nine reasons, right? All yeah. the same reasons. Like, I don't know that that's what I want to do. Please don't set that fucking expectation for me. Yeah. I wouldn't even know how to do that if yeah. I wanted to go try to do that. Mm -hmm. So if that's the thing that you expect me to do, shut up. Yeah. You know, like all all of that stuff. And I, it comes from this shared experience of you see someone pursuing an art form or something that's entertainment in any way. Mm -hmm. And you assume immediately what their goal is. Yeah. Fame. Yeah. You see someone doing stand up comedy in Austin, <coughs> Texas, and you're like, well, they're trying to get a Netflix special. Right. Here's yeah. all the reasons you're doing that wrong. Yeah. If you're in that. But maybe they just want to do two shows a week and right. keep their regular job. And that's the life that they want. Yeah. And I imagine that happens with violin, too, totally. where people are like, so when are you playing the Hollywood Bowl? And yeah. you're like, there are other places in the world for violin. Like, what? Yeah, no, that's definitely That's got to happen to you all the for time. For sure. And it's all about. What's your answer to that? Well, it's all about it? sacrifices. Everybody's sacrificing something right. all the time. And there are things that I have sacrificed to be where I am and there are things that other people have sacrificed to be where they are that I wasn't willing to sacrifice, you know? So for me, an example of that is that I went to grad school in New York City and I played a lot of violin in New York City and I got gigs and I had a great network of people, but um, I wanted to have pets. It's as simple as wanting, I wanted to have pets. You didn't have a place that would let you or you didn't uh, want to have the pets in that small of a place? I have pets that you can't... Well, you could have them in New York City. I have a flock of chickens oh, in my okay. backyard. Yeah, sure. So Austin's a place where you can have chickens. It's a great place to have chickens. <laughs> it is. Um, Not like California where you got to worry about coyotes and shit. Right. Well, you do have to worry about coyotes here depending on where you live. Really? But not in my neighborhood. Sure. Um, I actually live really close to here. So uh, in New York City, I was in a tiny apartment, and I loved my tiny apartment. I am not claustrophobic. I'm, I love cozy spaces. Uh, and I could have had a cat, you know, right. but I would have had a litter box and they would have thrown litter everywhere all over my tiny apartment. And yep. it just wasn't in my mind. I wanted to have pets enough to leave New York City. I hear that. <laughs> Which maybe to some people, they're like, what is wrong with her? The like, stress of having to hide my rabbit from everybody <laughs> in all the apartments I've lived in that I can't have pets in. Yeah. It's remember? a whole thing. I <laughs> call her my little Anne Frank. Oh, I that's know. cute. I have a rabbit also. I have to I have to hide her. Yeah. I have to like I there's and there's been so many times when I've literally like covered her cage with a sheet so it looks like a chest or something like that. Yeah. And the people are coming in to inspect and I'm right. like standing in front of it like don't she's like, drink on the water bottle. You know, yeah, no, I'm like sure. <clears throat> you know, like absolutely it's like the beginning of fucking uh what is it? Inglorious Bastards. <laughs> When I'm like sweating, I was talking ask to you the if you've people. Seen Jojo Rabbit. No, I haven't seen it yet, but I want to. It's about you know. Yeah, same vibe. Yep, and it's about there's a rabbit in it. Anyone who's offended by me comparing my rabbit's experience to the uh, <laughs> Jews in Nazi Germany, just just shut up. All Back right? off. It's a. Do you remember Kyle Kalina, bass player? Uh, vaguely. He was our year. Well, he was we're our not year, the same year. He was right. He was my year. Um, but he was very, he lived like a very off campus life. Mm -hmm. So you might not have ever run into him, but phenomenal bass player. I went to, I grew up with him and was in youth symphony with him. Um, hot, tall, quiet bass player, but on the outgoing side for bass players. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he had a, like a python or like a boa, something crazy, some Dope. giant snake. And he had it the whole time he was at NCSA, as far as I know, and, and would just hide it. Feed it sheep and stuff like that. I don't know what he was feeding it, but he Crazy. kept that thing. I mean, he had a snake in college, and I think he had it in the dorms. And I, you know, I mean, a, a large snake. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, probably slightly harder to hide than your rabbit. 
It is. And he hid it in college. You know, that's pretty It'd be impressive. easier to hide the rabbit in the snake. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, Not if you want to continue to own a rabbit. Yeah, absolutely true. No. I also grew up with a pet snake. I make, I make a lot of jokes about her safety. I love her very much. I want to make it yeah, clear that I'm do. not. But I have to be. I have to have a sense of humor about it because it's been so often that she's. I mean, she's old too. Um, she's uh, eight. Oh. And uh, yeah, she's so pretty. She's she's gorgeous. Um, but yeah, I've just been toting that. Man, this rabbit started in North Carolina. I had her in New York. I had her in California. Now she's here in Texas. That's she's amazing. Seen the whole world. She has. She's for a rabbit. I can't imagine traveling. With a rat, like moving across the country with a rabbit. Passenger seat of the car. It's tough. That's really impressive. You have to stop every day. I like to drive straight if possible. But you can't. But I can't because she has to stop and eat and they get um, anorexic when they're <gasps> uncomfortable. Oh. So like until she feels like everything is secure, she, she won't, won't eat. eat. And it'll, it'll do it to the point where it like almost kills her. Because My bunny has like, no problem can't eating. can't get nauseous. Oh. I know. It's so sad. But she's a white rabbit with blue eyes. <gasps> yeah, so she's Whoa, super pretty. Pretty. My ra- yeah. my rabbit is white with br- uh, gray spots, but he has brown eyes. Brown eyes are good. The red eyes are the scary ones. Yeah. Banicula. Yeah, 100%. My rabbit looks like Banicula with like the the non-evil twin. Right. Yeah, absolutely. She's very she's very um Easter bunny cute absolutely i wish my rabbit had blue eyes but i still love my rabbit i would say i'm more of a cat person than a rabbit person um my rabbit was an impulse buy but i, w- I, I love a dog him. really bad i want a dog too i'm not gonna get a dog because i have three cats that i'm very attached to and i have a lot of chickens 16 chickens and a rabbit so i don't also need yeah, a dog you don't, you don't need that and that the yeah. dog would have a lot to deal with and i work a lot and i wouldn't get have enough time for a dog yeah. But I want I do want a dog. But that's the that's the reason I left New York City. That's the main reason. Um and so back to this what have you sacrificed? I I sacrificed an amazing life in New York City because I wanted to have pets. So I chose somewhere that I could have pets. And Why here? Um I moved here for an ex-boyfriend who uh had to be here cuz he had a he has a son. It's mm-hmm. not past tense. He still has a son. Sure. Um, so I moved here for an ex-boyfriend, and that was super great for many years. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't great. Yeah, that's how that often goes, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of boyfriends, uh, do you want to tell your Beach Week story before we wrap this up? Because sure, it, sure. It's you're the only other person I've talked to who was there. Okay. Really? Yeah. What about you? Haven't like interviewed any of those people? Just Joe. Wow. Joe and I are the only ones who talked to you about it. Yeah. Um, the closest I think. Because I honestly haven't seen any of those people really since then, except I mean, they're for, mostly in LA, right? Yeah, but some of I, them are in New York. That entire crew of film students were not film students I knew. I knew Joe. Gotcha. I didn't know Dylan. I didn't know uh, Garel. Who even I didn't was know. it? Yeah. It was uh, off the top of my head. I might remember everybody, but it was Joe and Mackenzie, uh, John Maynard, who I have seen. John since Maynard. Then. Yeah. He's been to our house but i hadn't got a chance to have him on the show yet um dylan um garel uh drew valenti oh yeah was uh, he there uh-huh he went to jail he went to- these are the people i'm naming that yeah, it went yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. I-, I knew all the drama students because the class of 2010 right. was like my secondary drama class i and was who- really tight with all them because brandon harris is like my brandon harris. best friend from childhood and then there was some He's t- from here. there were some of them from the younger the one year younger class yep. like J- jen jen mckenzie jen and mckenzie i think were the ones yeah. ali bill was on it yeah but ali was in your class yep so it was, was like ace there? it was ali ace um jared Jared, Joe, uh, Brandon was down there. Yeah. Um, I don't think Hallie Cooper was in any of that no. stuff, and she was she was shot later. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Mm-hmm. It's pretty close. Yeah, that's, definitely yeah. dropped most of the names of the people that were there. Yes. But the the ones that went to jail, not you and I. We did not go to jail. Thank you. God. Do you know that I remember exactly, I don't know if you have this memory, but I remember exactly when they told us what happened and I remember what we were doing. Do you remember what we were doing? You and I were doing something together. <sighs> I think I have a memory of something, but it wasn't the same. I My instinct is that it was like cleaning up the spaghetti scene or something, 
But I think that actually wasn't when we found out because I think that was during the day and I think we found out at night. We did find out at night. It happened at night. Yeah. I was supposed to go. Why didn't you go? Um, I was supposed to fill in for Grell and Grip because he was playing the cop. Oh. So he was going to step in and be the shoulder of the cop in the like scene. Yeah. And so they were like, we need somebody just to be on lights and stuff like that. But there was no room for me in the car. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's dodge and, the bullet. <laughs> yep. A hundred percent. And they were like, we're going to drop everybody off and then. Like come back and get you. Yeah. Come back and get me. Well. And so we're all like drinking and smoking and stuff on the balcony of the hotel. Yeah. And we were taking turns playing the guitar. Oh. And uh, Brocky's, I think. We were playing Brocky's guitar, and I was playing it because I was supposed to play the guitar in the scene. Gotcha. Or I already had, maybe. We must have already, because we left right after we got everybody out yeah. of jail. Yeah. So I shot my scene. Yeah, we were scene, done. And my scene was like playing guitar on the beach. So... I had been, I don't, maybe it was my guitar. I don't remember, but I was playing it. It was and, probably Josh's. <laughs> and you, it was probably was. Uh, and you and I, I think specifically were playing. I could, I would love for someone to reach out to me and be like, this is not what happened, asshole. This is how it <laughs> happened. But I'm pretty confident. You and I were playing fucking Wagon Wheel. That's very likely. Doesn't that, first of all, that sounds like something that would be true. Oh, yeah. But I think it's true. Probably you and true. I, uh, on violin and guitar, playing Wagon Wheel, everyone's singing a song that we played. You know, every single time a bunch of people got together and drank. Every party, every for single all time. Eternity. So we're playing this fucking song that is such a you know a rite of passage for the evening, and um, I think Jared opens the sliding glass door to the balcony and goes, "Everyone's arrested." <laughs> and Jared and Mackenzie were dating at the time, right? Uh, yeah. I just remember Jared being like yeah. a bulldog yeah. about this because I think he was trying to be so, he was like trying to rescue McKinsey. Well, and the <laughs> problem was, and I could be mistaken, I, I wasn't drunk, but I, I remember being like, I think pretty stoned. That was the biggest problem at hand is everyone who hadn't, didn't have to go to this shoot was done for the night. So we were all partying. Right. So when we found out that everybody was in trouble, everyone was intoxicated. Yeah. And so we got a bunch of drunk kids going, right. whoa, wait, what do we do? Someone call Robert Besseda. This is crazy. Like, Did it, we call Robert Besseda? Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> because he was the kind of assistant dean that was like, let him help you get ahead of it. I definitely remember trying to figure out whose parents would freak out least. Right. And deciding upon Dylan's parents because they are the chillest. So, yeah. And I think I called them and got advice of what we should do. Because I, right. I definitely wasn't drunk because I was not a get drunk Sure, person. sure, sure. So I definitely wasn't drunk, but I also had no clue how to proceed. Right. And I was like, should None we, of us did. we have to bail them. I was like, my whole... I was very fixated on we have to bail them out. How it, are we going to get bail money? It took like, us that's what I was fixated so on. long into the night, like probably a couple of hours to make it. And if anybody's listening to this now, let this be a lesson to you. Save yourself the two hours. We should there were maybe probably... give the ba a little bit of backstory. Yeah, no, we can. We can. Yeah, that's a good point. First of all, anyone listening to this who's like, what the fuck are you talking about? I will break it down a little bit more, but... Go and listen to the episode with Joe Flanders, episode 19, I think it is, we did story. back in May. We did like a 10, 12 minute segment on it um, where we break it down piece by piece. But essentially, we're at the beach, we're shooting a teen comedy. There is a scene that's pretty racy in the movie. We're shooting that particular scene. It gets misunderstood by the locals. They call the cops. We didn't have a permit. We didn't have a permit to shoot where we were shooting. Which was the whole shooting. problem. The cops showed up and arrested eight people, All including of two of our actors, everybody who was on set, um, for shooting what they perceived to be pornography, even though it was simulated. We later come to find out that even simulated sex acts that you're filming in public are against the law in South Carolina. Right. I that, think filming without a permit is illegal. I think it is, but that wasn't part of the charges. That wasn't, that wasn't okay. No, we were participating in the preparation of obscene materials right. for the purpose of dissemination. I'll never forget it for the rest of my whole life. That's exactly now that you the say charge. It, I'm like, yep, yep. That's, yeah, that's it. What it was. I remember that. And do you um, still have uh, one of those shirts? No, I never got one. I had one, and I have no clue where it went. I love that. But Dylan looked. So hot in his mugshot. Yeah, right? I will never forget how it's he true. looked in his mugshot. It was he like, was like the Frank hottie. Sinatra mugshot. Yeah, it was you like best I mean? Dylan's ever looked. Dylan's a cutie. Yeah, this was the best Dylan ever looked. It was super bomb. It was. It was. It was as. He was good, like a model. Headshot. It was as good looking 
mugshot for Dylan as it was a bad <laughs> mugshot for Mackenzie, the poor girl. I actually think she looked very beautiful, but Mackenzie's Mackenzie was such a trooper because Mackenzie was in expression yeah. in that moment is so indicative and so is Joe's. They're all pretty good, but Mackenzie and Joe's mugshots are so good. Because they both feel exactly how yeah. you would feel if yeah. you heard the story about how they felt. And then yeah. you immediately show that on screen. Maybe I'll do it right here. It's like, this guy feels bad for getting that girl into this problem. And this girl regrets ever signing up for doing this. Totally. Because and you can't blame either of them. Do you remember that Mackenzie... She, Mackenzie was the only girl, first of all. So she yep. was like one of eight, and she was the only girl. Yep. And she was wearing a bikini the whole time. Right. She was wearing a bikini at the beach during the scene. She was wearing a bikini when she got arrested. Mm -hmm. She was wearing a bikini in the jail cell, and they would not even give her a blanket. Yeah. She was in a bikini freezing her ass off in this jail cell for like 24 hours. So fucked up. Yeah. Horrible. So of course she looks like that. Oh, 100%. She still looks amazingly gorgeous, beautiful, as always, but she looks miserable I mean because she was a, and, and let me be fair they didn't even feed tear them down the girl we just talked earlier about how beautiful she is she's so gorgeous it's a mugshot under the circumstances of what happened yeah and the thing I was going to come back to earlier that I was like let this be a lesson to you save yourself the two hours we got a group of 12 to 16 mostly drunk kids under the age of 25 under, under the age we of were, 24 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, minus Andrew Gorell we find out is like 26 years <laughs> old at the hearing but other than that, um, it took us two hours to convince and learn as a group that there's nothing to be done tonight. Right. Because we were like, none, we got to get them out. No How do we get them out? No group had ever spent the night in jail because of yeah. like DUI or something right. like that. And it only would have taken one of them to be like, hey, 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 everybody Relax. listen up. Nothing is getting done tonight. Yeah. Our friends are going to be in jail all night, period. They don't let people out of jail at night. Yeah. And that was we had no idea. Yeah, we I spent that. two hours being yeah. like, how do we what where should we go over there? Yeah, we wanted to all drive we over all there. Thought, I yeah. think Jared really wanted to go there. And we all had to convince a number of people. A, we're not going over there. And B, there's nothing we can do. Yeah. Not until tomorrow. Yeah. They're going to have to spend. The I was one of the I was one of the earliest. Let's not let's relax because we can't do anything. I was one right. of the yeah, first same. people to probably because we were the most sober. Yeah, that's probably true. We and didn't also have like because it wasn't my first time. Complexes. I spent the night in a Houston jail, not in it, uh, in the lobby, uh, trying to get my stepdad out on a bogus thing. Whoa! And um, so you knew there was not a lot of a hundred percent because even though we had paperwork in process to get him out, and basically what it was is he got picked up on a traffic thing, but he had an outstanding warrant right. that had been cleared in another county, but they hadn't sent it everywhere, I right. guess. So when they ran his shit, it was like, you still have this warrant out. Yeah. And um, so we were all night trying to get the sheriff's office in this county to send the info to this county so that he could get out. So it was the rare kind of circumstance where if we had gotten it moved through, yeah. he would have gotten out in the middle of the night. So you had to be there. But in this case, even in those circumstances where we had everything we could do and he was going to get out as soon as we could get it processed, it took a fucking night. Yeah. Because the people at the police station at nighttime at all police stations all over the country until I encounter an exception to this rule are in no way motivated to get anything done. Yeah. They're not like, oh, man, we got to get this guy out of here. Of course they're not. They're like, what happened? They didn't even put a blanket on McKenzie in the Yeah, let suit. me finish Minecraft, and then I'll come over there and yeah. look at it. Like, they are chilling. I definitely meant Minesweeper, because I meant to go older, <laughs> and somehow I played the We're very version. young. Yeah. There's a bunch of cops We're playing 19. Minecraft, not doing their jobs. You yeah. take that as fact. Um, But then, yeah, but so you're you're dating one of these dudes who's in jail. Yeah, he was in jail, yeah. What was that like being on the other side? I wasn't you, you worried. You weren't freaking like Jared No, was. I wasn't. Jared was very, but I can You were in a different circumstance. I was in a different circumstance. Yeah. Gender roles. Dylan was not in a bikini. <laughs> Dylan was and fully clothed. he had all clothed. his homies with him. Dylan was fully clothed. Dylan's very chill. Yeah. Dylan He's a put together is, fella. Yeah. Very mature. Head on his shoulders. Always has been. Very rational. So I knew he was fine. Right. I'm sure he was uncomfortable, but I don't think he was like- freaking out and right. I I assumed he wasn't freaking out but I think Jared I think was correct in assuming that Mackenzie was probably the most upset of all the people a hundred percent because she was Jared like Jared is not always the most chill dude either when it comes right. to like oh my god what are we gonna do and he's such a nice guy and, and he, he like wants to make sure McKenzie. every 
Right. And he wants to make sure everybody is like safe and comfortable and like especially McKenzie, obviously. Yeah. So 100%. I just remember him being very concerned. Yeah, he's a good and dude. And we basically had to like, you know, make Subdue. him not go. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, just trank dart in the neck. Just we had to put right. Jared to bed. Give Pretty him some much. Benadryl. Yeah. yeah, something like that. I don't remember anything beyond that. I remember feeling unconcerned about Dylan because I knew he was ch- going to be chill about it. Right. As chill as one can be. And I remember once we found out that we could not do anything, kind of being resolved to just relax. Right. Um, and then I don't remember really the next day. I don't really remember like getting them Did you out. Go to the bond hearing where they walked them all out in the chains and shit. Were you there? <laughs> the fucking Pirates of the Caribbean I chain do, gang and yeah, shit. Yeah, I do remember them walking them out. It's my favorite thing that happened. <laughs> oh my God, it's so surreal that this happened. I'm such an asshole, but I'm very cavalier with telling the story just because A, it didn't well, happen to me. it's hilarious. And uh, yeah, it's fucking insane. They all can laugh about it now, I'm sure. And Most like, of them, yeah, all probably. of us know that we weren't doing anything wrong. You exactly. know, so it's kind of like, this is a misunderstanding, and yes, we're dealing with the actual that out, legal system. they're just going to cut the cuffs off all these fucks and let them walk out of here. We really thought that. We're we like, really thought that. All the judge needs to hear is what happened. The and real then, story. And we had three lawyers. It was like one person had a lawyer, another person had a lawyer, and then there was another lawyer defending everybody else. Yeah, and they were, de- I only I only really remember this through Dylan because we were dating. Right. But like he had to deal with this for quite a long time. Oh, they dealt with it for a, a shitload of time. They had to do all this community service and pay all these dues. It was a fucking nightmare. Yeah, and then like way after the fact, remember it showed up on like Megyn Kelly's talk show? Yeah, it was on Fox News. Yeah. Yeah. Like months later. We used it to sell the show when we finally they oh, cut yeah. it together. I do they made a that. promo with the fucking yeah. Fox News thing in it. So crazy. So I don't really remember much of the aftermath other than it was a much more serious issue than we thought. Right. And um, that it took months to solve. And it just makes you realize how little control you have over anything in your life, you know? And Look up the laws. Look up the permits. Whew. Do your homework. Yeah. You I mean, there. that's but certainly. also make your shit. Yeah. That certainly taught me something about getting permits. Yeah. For sure. 100%. Even for things you might not think you need a permit for. Err on the side of caution. Do you have any final thoughts? I feel like we probably have 15 loose ends that aren't going to get tied up. A hundred percent. And maybe that's just part of how it goes. Maybe the, my lack of having guests in Austin will result in okay. you coming on the show every couple of weeks. And, and telling everybody it. what my dad does. Yeah. And we'll, lo- we'll, we'll tie it all up. Please don't tell me what your dad does I don't right want, I'm not going to. It, it's too much. I want you to I, have me back. I need episode two. A hundred percent. Well, thank you so much for doing it. I'm Thanks so for glad having to me. Have you. It was super fun. Awesome.